for general surgery residency who may be attending virtually and uh, welcome you all virtually to the University of Louisville Department of Surgery. We are going to spend the day convincing you this is the place where you want to do your surgical training. And that starts by introducing Dr. Keith Miller, who's going to give grand rounds this morning. Dr. Miller is a Hoosier, uh, attended DePaul University before medical school at Indiana University. We recruited him here for the general surgery residency program where he excelled, uh, did critical care fellowship, and now is uh, a soon-to-be professor in department of surgery. Uh, Keith, part of our trauma program, he, is, uh, he has been heavily involved in uh, our violence prevention programs at the University of Louisville and community outreach. His CV has more community outreach and media activities than, uh, he, he, than anything else. Although he is widely published, he's our nutrition expert here at the University of Louisville and plays many other important roles in our teaching program. Uh, as you will see in a second, Dr. Miller uh, is an outstanding educator. His uh, presentations are always entertaining and occasionally educational. And uh, Dr. Miller, we thank you for everything that you do uh, and including grand round this morning. Occasionally educational, I think that's appropriate. Uh, so this morning we're going to uh, talk about the firearm injury epidemic, and uh, the title of this talk is Guns, Germs, and Steel, and so my first disclosure is obviously I stole the title, okay? Many of you have read this book. If you haven't, we'll talk about it a little bit. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures related to this topic. I do always say in these talks that I am not a public health expert. I don't have a PhD or an MPH or any of the relevant degrees that go with that. So uh, sometimes I get out of my uh, get out of my lane, as we'll as we'll see throughout this a little bit. But we're going to try to stay away from overt politics. Now, there's no way that we can have this discussion without bumping up against these issues from time to time. But we're going to try to stay out of the emotional aspects of the political discussion that's so central to this ongoing discussion. So I'll get this slide thing down here shortly. So how many of you have read this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel? So a lot of you have. Uh, it's by Jared Diamond. It's really a story uh, from his own words as to how the world that was became the world that is. It talks about how resources and geography were key and integral to the development of a story of which civiliz civilizations prospered and conquered while others withered and disappeared, in their words. Uh, he says his book can be summarized in one sentence. Different peoples follow different courses because of different environments, not biologic differences among the peoples themselves. Um, you don't have to tell me whether you thought this was a good book or a bad book. I'll, I'll present the criticism of this book on the other side. Uh, it's been called academic porn by fellow anthropologists, uh, suggesting that uh, Diamond makes all the factors of European domination a product of distant and accidental history assigns almost no role for human agency, the ability people have to make decisions and influence outcomes. Just because you have guns and steel does not mean you should use them for colonial purposes. And as you think about this, environment and human agency, and I think this is relevant to the discussion we're gonna have today because this is central in the ongoing discourse that our country's having about the interaction between humans and firearms. And I'll try to play that out here through the course of this discussion. So today we're gonna do three parts with the third part being abbreviated, but part one, guns. Okay, we're gonna talk about epidemiology, terminology and root cause contributors to the firearm injury epidemic. Then we're gonna talk about germs. How are germs related to this? Well, I think we've learned a lot about public health issues over the last five years. You guys have lived this every day. And so we're gonna talk about how the COVID pandemic maybe has informed us on how to deal with public health issues in positive ways and negative ways. And then the steel part is acknowledging the surgical management of firearm injury and how the people in this room are integral to the ongoing care of, of individuals who suffer firearm injuries. 
So part one, guns. Guns, bullets are truly a marvel of engineering. They are designed for a purpose and they're very good at doing that. I think when you talk about ballistics, I think this slide covers most of what ballistics you need to know to take care of patients. First, that it's a function of energy, all right? You can go back to your high school physics class, right? If you can remember these equations, energy is a function of mass and velocity, all right? Cavitation, cavitation is an important principle. We see this clinically uh, in the operating room. It's the ex rapid expansion and contraction of tissues. If you're talking about a muscle that cavitates, it may not be as clinically impactful as if you're talking about brain tissue can be incredibly impactful to the long-term morbidity and mortality associated with these injuries. As far as engineering goes, you can do various things to this weaponry to make it more effective at its stated purpose, whether you're talking about jacketing, whether you're talking about solid versus hollow tips, fragmentation, which we've seen in the civilian population some as well, where upon impact, one projectile becomes six to eight projectiles uh, for maximal tissue damage. Ultimately, it comes down to oftentimes where you're shot being more important than what you're shot with. If you are shot in the head or the trunk, that has substantially higher morbidity and mortality than if you're shot in the extremity. So oftentimes, location, location, location is the primary determinant of outcomes if you take all patients that arrive at a hospital at a reasonable time frame. Important, we call these penetrating injuries. But bullets don't cut, bullets crush, okay? So if you think about a projectile moving through soft tissue and crushing everything in its path and they cavitate. So that's an important principle. That's your ballistics lesson. You should, if you know this, you should be able to move forward from that standpoint. This is an American problem. You all are familiar that the United States firearm homicide, homicide rate far exceeds those of our peer countries. What do we mean by a peer country? Here we're talking about the Human Development Index, which is a United Nations parameter to evaluate where nations are along economic development and such, and we are an outlier here. So much so that you've seen these graphs before with various public health issues, whether you're talking about obesity or any of these things, and you've seen how just in one year, 2019 to 2020, they're having, to, you look at the legend, they're having to increase and bump up the ranges that they're using to evaluate this. You can see that the Southeast, which includes us, uh, is uh, disproportionately impacted when you, when you look at the rest of the country. And that's mortality, mortality, okay? This is a young people problem. This is one of the top five causes of death in the first through fifth decades of life. So if, whether you're talking about accidental injuries, unintentional up there, talking about suicides, you're talking about homicides. In the first five decades of life, this is going to be one of the top five causes of death. There's all kinds of data problems with this issue. That's why it becomes very difficult to have some of these discussions, because the foundational data that we're using in order to have these discussions has inherent flaws. I can tell you that Wolf County has the highest gun rate death in Kentucky. But what does that mean? That means that they had two deaths in a population of 6,500. That doesn't make those two deaths any less important, but you have to be precise and accurate in what you're talking about if you're looking about 200 gun deaths in Jefferson County, okay? So when you talk about high gun, gun death rates, you have to be very specific about what you're talking about. Well, you'll see this here. We'll kind of get into some of the more specifics as we move forward. There's significant terminology issues, nomenclature issues when you're talking about gun violence. What is gun violence, quote unquote, okay? Is suicide gun violence? If I accidentally shoot myself in the extremity, is that gun violence? If you and I use this term very differently, gun violence, I think, is a, it's an umbrella term that accounts for all the different injuries that occur when humans interact with firearms. But when we use it in, out at the, you know, out as you're having a discussion out in public and such, most people interpret that to mean interpersonal assaults and mass shootings. But there are multiple forms of firearm injury, including accidental law enforcement shootings and, and intentional self-inflicted injuries. But I think if we're gonna move through this, as we talk about public health approaches, 
we have to start to subtype these injuries as we discuss potential solutions to these problems. The analogy would be cancer. Okay, cancer is multiple distinct disease issue entities, right? There's a fundamental tie bond that ties these issues. But if you treat lung cancer, just like you treat prostate cancer, you, will, you would not expect optimal outcomes. And what you're doing may have no impact on the primary disease process, okay? So we have all these types of therapy out there for cancers, but you have to start with making the right diagnosis and the wrong treatment results in poor results. So as you move forward, as we move forward and we start talking about this in a scientific way, uh, you guys can see that too, huh? Move that. You can see that we need to start saying, this is the subset of fire injury, arm injury that we're talking about. And this is what we're gonna do with that information, okay? So um, this is an important uh, point. Different problems in different places. Is Louisville experiencing the same types of problems that some of our more rural counties are facing? If you look at the Kiprick data, which is Kentucky's data, accidental injuries or unintentional injuries comprise the majority of injuries seen in hospitals in Kentucky, outside Jefferson County. Suicide comprises the majority of fatalities in not only counties outside of Jefferson, but if you include Jefferson in the whole state. However, if you pull Jefferson County out, it's interpersonal firearm injuries by and far, results in injuries and results in fatalities. So different problems in different places. And as you try to have conversations with different people across your state, across the country, you have to acknowledge that what they're seeing and what their problems are in their mind may be very different from what you're talking about. So fundamental question, what causes gun violence? That's a loaded question, right? That's a big question. And uh, if you're out talking about this, you say, oh, it's bad people, bad families, bad choices, drugs, gangs, too many guns. We have a violent culture. All these things are what you're going to talk about when you have these issues. But that's not really the way we want to think about this, because that is dependent upon the perspective you're coming from. You might not even get away with just saying if you say it's a multifactorial issue, maybe you're getting a little closer. But as you think about this issue, I want you to remember the socioecological model. OK, this is a this is a this is a good way to build this understanding in your mind because it acknowledges that there are individual risk factors, including firearm access, impulsivity, employment status, interpersonal as we move up. Right now, you're talking about conflict resolution. You're talking about humans interacting with humans here. OK, uh, then you move over to the community side. Uh, yeah, illicit drug trade, is that active in a community? How is law enforcement's relationship with the community? Now you move out to societal sides. Now you're talking about what is policy and legislative issue initiatives that are happening in different, if, if from a societal perspective, this is where you, you get into cultural norms that potentially support violence. Uh, and so as you think about it this way, as you, support, as you use this framework, you can start to peel this apart and start to find potential solutions. If someone asks you, what's the solution to this problem? And they've got a one word or a one sentence answer or one, one, uh, one, one uh, idea or one concept proposition, it's, it's, that's not gonna work, okay? You're gonna have to attack this from multiple different levels. And as you start to peel it away, you can begin to do that. So let me give you an example from the model, okay? Let's start with an easy one. Let's, talk, let's start with an individual issue. Uh, let's start with an easy one. Let's start, you know, with guns. Okay. Um, so if we think about firearm access as an individual risk factor, an individual level issue, you can already see the problems with this. You can already see that this is going to jump around to other parts of this continuum, right? We're going to move into societal issues and such. But firearm exposure is substantial and unique in the United States. All right. Gun ownership, as you know, deeply embedded in our culture. 400 million firearms, more than that. Uh, United States has the highest rate of civilian gun ownership. Uh, uh, 120 firearms per 100 residents. We're the only country that has more firearms than civilians. Is anyone from a state other than Kentucky? Where are you from? California. Thank you, John. I thought you were going to give me a geography test, and I wouldn't know. But California. <laughs> That one I know. California has the same, there's the same number of civilian guns in California that there are in China. Do we have another state? Yeah. Texas. You know where Texas. 
Germany. Okay, I think the state to fly, country fire or firepower comparison is useful. Just to understand. Now, this is civilian. This is civilian guns. Okay, this doesn't count military and such. All right, about fifty percent of Kentuckians own a gun. Guns and ammo says we're the fifth best state to own a gun in uh, down there. So there's the point is there are a lot of guns in the United States, and so you can see, as I mentioned before, this isn't necessarily an individual level issue. Now, it is moves across here. Now you just want to start talking about firearm policy and regulation. This is where everyone's blood pressure goes up. Everybody's like, oh, this is something that um, um, uh, I feel this way about or that way about. Um, I'm sorry, it's not advancing. If you're going to get into discussions on legislation and policy revision, first you need to know there are federal laws as to who can and can't have a gun. Those are listed here. I'm not asking you to read all these or memorize these, but if you want to get into discussions about this, you should know these. All right. But the federal laws don't necessarily apply to states. So, so individual, the, the federal laws do apply to states, but states have their own uh, legislative initiatives as well. So you can, you, if you're going to work in this space, I know we have folks from across the country here. Every state has its own set of laws, okay? And so here's Kentucky's. Again, I don't expect you to look at this or read this right now. If you want a copy, it's out there. I can summarize it for you. Um, and we did this as we were working through a task force trying to address some of these issues. So we do know that injuries are a function of shots fired. That seems intuitive, but there's not a lot of data out there to, to, to actually demonstrate that that's the case. So this is from an acoustic gunshot detection system in Louisville. Okay, how many of you have heard of this technology? If a gun is fired in a city and you have these sensors up there, it picks it up, it registers it. A lot of times uh, 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 it'll send it out and EMS or uh, your law enforcement agency will respond. Okay, so it counts the number of gunshot discharges. We have six square miles of coverage in Louisville, Kentucky from 18 to 21. Okay, uh, and this is not Google, Kentucky. For those of you that are not from here, we are not on the ocean. But I wanted to give you an example. They try to, they try to keep, uh, they try to keep where the sensors are somewhat under wraps. But this is unbelievable. Six square miles of coverage over two years, sixteen thousand shots fired. Okay, go to twenty twenty one. 40,000 shots fired, six square mile radius in Louisville, Kentucky. Six square miles is 1.6% of the total geographic area of Louisville, Kentucky. So 1.6% of Kentucky. Now, it's not proportionally distributed across the, as across the county, as we'll talk about here in a second. But 1.6%, 40,000 shots fired in two years. And by... This is intuitive, but again, there's not a lot of data that show this, and it's hard to do, but your injuries go up, your, your fatalities go up. These are a couple of residents, uh, B and uh, uh, Will, that helped work on this project, done a fantastic job. Um, and this is a graph that, that shows exactly what you'd expect. Number of shots fired, number of injuries, linear relationship. All right. What about firearm types in Louisville, Kentucky? Okay, what we've seen from 18 to 23, uh, a couple things here. The percentage of automatic weapons fired in Louisville, Kentucky has gone from almost none, 0% in 2018 to 7% in 2021. Or 2023, I'm sorry, 2023. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, uh, green line here. High capacity rounds from 7% to 30%. Okay, now we have to be precise in what we're talking about. Does anyone in here, no, I'm not even going to ask that question. An automatic weapon is not synonymous with an assault weapon, okay? Automatic weapons are not available in the civilian population. So when you say assault rifle, you're not necessarily referring to an automatic weapon. How do you get an automatic weapon, meaning one trigger pull, multiple shots fired, versus a semi-automatic, pull, 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 okay? How do you get an automatic weapon? <coughs> it's either machine gun, all right? Or a black switch, which is commonly sort of permeated in the United States. What you do is you take this little thing, you print it off in a 3D printer, you put it on the back of a nine millimeter and you have an automatic weapon, okay? And so this 
accounts for that. All right. And then high capacity magazines, more than 10 shots fired without reloading. Okay, so so that's what it looks like firearm types in Louisville. So as you look at what the people that are injured as a result of these shot fired, most of them, as I said, are interpersonal injuries. You can see that uh, they're young. Uh, there's significant disparities in Louisville as to who's being shot from race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, and in hospital, or hospital disposition, all that stuff, don't pay attention to that much, but here is the, the profile of what is the injuries that are happening in Louisville, Kentucky. And so the only thing I tell you about policy and legislative initiatives is you have to make sure that what problem you're talking about matches with the policy that you try to change one way or the other. OK, so you would take this set of issues and say, in order to address this set of issues. Which of these ideas or buckets of legislative revision or policy reform that you're going to take are expected to change this if this is our goal? That's what I'm talking about as we think about this, OK, because it's not going to be the same thing for that that you're looking for if you want to reduce the number of suicides by firearm in your state, it's not gonna be the same policy revision. Just like radiation chemo may not be applicable to certain cancers, but may be applicable to others. So let's talk about a bigger problem or a more complex issue, more complex than guns as we talk about firearm injuries, all right? Let's talk about structural violence and let's see what that is. This is sort of an example of a multifactorial issue or a multi-level issue. I told you about the disparities that we see in Louisville, Kentucky. If you're shot in the United States and if you're killed by firearm and you're white, there's an 80% chance it was suicide. If you're killed by firearm and you're black, there's an 80% chance it's homicide, okay? Stark disparities. Uh, uh, you can see the age adjusted rates, seven, seven and a half times higher for, for black individuals compared to white individuals. Hispanics, four times higher. You can't see it because that thing's in the way. Is it bad the way? I don't know. I don't know. If only we had the technology. <laughs> I don't know. Where do you want it? We'll take a boat. I don't know how to make it go away. Definitely not there. Let's try that. All right, structural violence. Is structural violence the same as physical violence? No, I mean, these are, these are separate things. Physical violence... These are injuries not caused by individuals. These are caused by systems, okay? Social structures or institutions that harm people by preventing them from meeting their basic needs. It's closely related to structural racism, structural racism being focused specifically on race rather than other ethnicity or religious issues, you know, whatever other issues this, these, these situations arise from. It's systematic, it's systemic, it creates unfair disadvantage for populations. The way to think about it, and we'll get into some more examples so you can understand it, but it takes all the risk factors out there, it takes the population, you dump it through this filter, structural violence, and all the risk factors get dumped on a small subset of the population and fewer exerted across the rest of the population. What this sets up is sets up a stage for the emergence of multiple public health issues in the same population. Okay, so that when we say we're talking about gun violence, but as I'll show you, you want to talk about food insecurity, you want to talk about the COVID pandemic, you want to talk about disproportionately impacts populations over and over and over again. So obviously there's something that's contributing to this ongoing piece. So I'm going to give you an example of that. An example of this is structural violence, or of structural violence is redlining. How many of you heard of redlining? Good. Good. All right. So I don't have to go into this a whole bunch, but it's the practice of denying services to residents in certain areas based on racial, racial or ethnic composition. You know this after the Great Depression, <clears throat> the United States was trying to reinfuse capital into the and they were to trying to decide where to put that money. Where do we invest? OK. And so they asked the HOLC to create security maps, 200 plus cities. Uh, you can go find your city, uh, probably. Louisville has one. We're going to see that. Maps were assigned a grade A through D. OK, this is what that meant. A meant uh, A was an homogenous area, a predominantly white or completely white area. A D was an undesirable population or an infiltration of it. So high, neighborhoods with high percentages of African-Americans or black immigrant populations invariably rated D. 
Okay. Uh, most A areas, state area A areas by having deeds like this. No person other than one of the wider Caucasian race should be permitted to occupy any property in this area. Okay, so that's how A stayed A's. These policies explicitly persisted well into the 70s. You can go find case law, but uh, but but have structurally persisted to today. So here is Louisville's redlining map. Again, there's maybe one so kind of burn that into your brain for those of you that aren't from Louisville. You can you can you can erase it here shortly. <laughs> you don't have to remember. So every city has its history, and this gets very interesting as you go. If you if you have a city that you're, you 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 love and have been uh, and lived in for a while, you can go find its history. Here's Louisville's, or at least a part of it. Um, so that map is the flood map from 1937. We had a huge flood; half of Louisville was underwater. Okay, um, uh, these are some pictures from that event. Um, and uh, this map is from the BBC after Muhammad Ali died. They talked about segregation in Muhammad Ali's hometown. And so the B, I should, the, should say BBC in there. So what that map is showing you is that green dots are black residents and orange dots are white residents, okay? And so what you can see is that much of the black population lives in, lived in what was once the floodplain, which was also red line and yellow line back in the day. So that's, those are from the redlining map. Okay. Sorry, they're a little off. It took me hours to draw that map, actually. <laughs> I'm actually embarrassed looking at it. But, uh, but, but uh, that's the redlining map. All right. And so when we took a map of the distribution of where our firearm injuries and fatalities were happening, and you drop it on the redlining map, you find that a red line, that a red line area, D, you have a five times greater chance of being shot than an A area. C two times, it's like a, it's like this, like this. And Ben's, uh, Matt Ben's wrote this with us, and several of our partners. Uh, red line neighborhoods in 1937 have significantly more gunshot wounds today. This is the impact of historical and institutional racism on modern gun violence marriage merits acknowledgement and further study. So let's peel the onion a little bit later. I told you it emerges a multiple public health issue. <clears throat> food security, where are our grocery stores? Where do we get our food? Red areas, just for the sake of consistency, are areas where there are not grocery stores, okay? Uh, green areas, there's lots of grocery stores, there's lots of food access, there's uh, 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 mobility amongst your population. And what you'll see is now if you dump the gun, if you dump firearm injuries on this same map, what you'll find is you're one and a half times more likely if you live in a food insecure area to be shot than if you do not live in a food insecure area. Uh, this is where you can pull in all these, uh, the, you know, you can pull in multiple disciplines. And so now you're starting to build, you're starting to peel the onion, you're starting to see the multiple layers at work here. So structural racism is a potent contributor to the observed disparities and uh oh, fire. You no, know, we got some of our crew heading out for a level one activation. Structural racism is a potent contributor to the observed disparities in firearm injury, food insecurity. I showed you two, those two things in Louisville, Kentucky, and multiple other issues as we transition to the second part of the talk, which is germs, COVID 19. You can see. The darker colors are areas of Jefferson County that were disproportionately impacted from a fatality perspective from the COVID-19 pandemic. Same map, over and over and over again, okay? So germs, what have we learned from the pandemic? Again, this is Will, he's a prolific writer. Um, I'm, glad he, I'm glad he lets me uh, tag along with him. Uh, but uh, what do we learn from the pandemic? Well, the first slide is something that you need to know, which most trauma centers in cities across the country experience. 2019, firearm violence down here, 2020, exploded everywhere across the country. What we wanted to look at was how do you compare apples to apples? How do you compare the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to the impact of firearm morbidity and mortality, okay? And so what we did was we calculated the years of potential life lost 
from firearm injury in Louisville, Kentucky, and compared it to the years of life lost from the COVID pandemic. All right. And as you can see here, because firearm injury impacts young individuals and has a high case fatality rate, that we lost twice as many years to gun violence as we did COVID-19. If you want to look at interpersonal violence, we lost substantially more. If you say, well, yeah, but everywhere in the country, it was just massive increases after COVID. What about years before that? A non-COVID year, every year for the preceding 10 years, looks like the graph on the left, where we're losing essentially an equivalent number of years of potential life to this issue. So this is just to say that in Jefferson County, does this apply to another county, a rural county down the road? No, probably not, right? But this applies to Jefferson County. And so in this way, COVID and firearm injury are similar in some ways, and they're also very different. So let's acknowledge those. They're both public health issues, morbidity, mortality. I argue they're both preventable, okay, to some degree. Uh, they're both expensive if you want to deal with them. We know that. <clears throat> Disparities are evident in both. I showed you the COVID map from Jefferson County. I showed you the firearm injury map from Jefferson County. The responses may require uncomfortable measures, no doubt about that, right? Uh, we all went through COVID pandemic and argued one way or another about what became a very politicized issue. They're also different in some ways. COVID-19 was a global problem. This is a very American problem. Um, it's global. Over here on the gun violence side, you got variable, variable locations and incidents. Small city in, or small town in Kentucky doesn't have the same concerns that Louisville, Kentucky has. There's a vaccine for COVID, not for firearm injury. COVID scared everybody. Gun violence disproportionately scares part of our population and not so much other parts of our population. Okay, so those are some ways that they're different. What does this translate to once you get the stamp certified public health issue? You turn on the faucet and money starts rolling out. No stamp, no money. And until it equates to a lot of zeros, billions, COVID's probably up trillions, isn't it? I don't know by now. But gun violence, 16 projects, okay, uh, $8 million. That's the federal funding that's been committed to this particular problem. Um, so we're going to talk about why some of the barriers you run into, and you know they're into, you know what some of them are. But uh, so this was the American College of Physicians had a couple of journals where they had multiple articles addressing firearm injury. The NRA did not appreciate that. They posted that on their Twitter account and said uh, self-important gun doctors should stay in their lane. They say half of the Annals of Medicine articles are pushing for gun control. Uh, most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. So this post came out on social media. And then after that, you can see that a lot of doctors, physicians, whether you're talking about pediatricians, medical doctors, surgeons, all came out, including Smith, and said, uh, you know, no, it's, uh, um, we do have something to say about this issue. We're obligated to say something about this issue. And so this is where that stay in your lane thing came from. Is everyone familiar with that? So it was kind of stay in your lane, do what you're told to do, and we don't want to hear from you otherwise. So after this, the reason I bring this up is just to say that every organization started firing out a statement after this, okay? Whether you're talking about PEDS or uh, uh, the emergency medicine, whether you're talking about family physicians, everyone fired out an organizational statement. But if you read them all, if you got just un un ungodly amounts of time on your hands, you can go read them all. Basically, it boils down to these four things. Suggest some policy revision, promote program implementation, promote funding, and promote a public health approach. And it seems like, you know, you know, when they come out with an organizational statement and it doesn't really say anything, and you're like, well, that's pretty, that, that has no teeth. When you first look at this, you might feel that way. But I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why this public health approach is so essential to what we're talking about. I talked about the tap, you turn it on the tap once you're a certified public health issue. Monkeypox, our 6,000th case 
bam, got the stamp, public health issue. That's not to de-emphasize the importance of monkeypox and its impact on our populations. That's to say, after the 6,000th case, the tap went on. All right? We're well beyond that. So uh, is it a winnable battle, gun violence? I understand that's tough. Sometimes it does not feel that way. I would propose it is. But it didn't make the CDC's list of winnable battles. Uh, how, is it an important battle? I think so. Didn't make that list, that list either. Oh, and I drew that too. <laughs> so firearm injury didn't show up on any of these lists. And so it's not been acknowledged as a public health issue, and that's the problem. Let's have, and so let's let's look at one, what does that translate to? How does that change our understanding of these problems? What is the incidence of COVID-19 in Louisville, Kentucky? If I put this in my search engine, I get this. I can tell you how many cases there were yesterday. I can tell you how many there were the day before. I can tell you who's vaccinated. I can show you maps of where every, every COVID related data point. Look at that, it's beautiful. Most, most cities in the country had a dashboard like this up and running during the pandemic. What's the incidence of firearm injury in Louisville, Kentucky? Put that in your search engine. What do you get? I'm trying. This is what you get. What is the injury of firearm injury? What's the incidence of injury of firearm injury? Incidence of injury in Louisville, Kentucky. This is what you'll get. <clears throat> fatality data. Fatality data. Fatality data, fatality data, fatality data. That one's our paper, so it doesn't count. So you got to throw it out. All right? You can't find a number. You can't find a number. We've got great data about fatalities, essentially no data on injury incidents. Okay? So you, you can't answer fundamental questions. So what so how do you determine an injury incidence? Well, I'm I told you I have no, I've had no formal education in public health. And yeah, I was able to figure out what this equation looks like. It looks like this. You got to have the number of cases and the total population. That's what you need to calculate an incidence. All right. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, I think even a I think we can answer this question. We have the population. And here's the problem. The number of firearm injuries, gaps. We don't talk. We don't share our data. Here's where the data comes from. Hospitals, law enforcement agencies, public health has some consumer organizations. Guns are like consumer properties, too, just like your TV. You know, they're like, this TV is not safe. Every time you turn it on, it blows up the room, right? You shouldn't buy this TV. Firearms are looked at that way, too. Okay, so they have some data. Uh, media, right? You, gun violence, and then private groups and pooled archives, like Gun Violence Archive, do a tremendous amount of, of, of good work in this space. But all this data is all spread out. So if you want to use HCUP or NEDS or NIT, you, if you want to use the National Inpatient Sample, you're going to, I'll, I'll show you that you'll miss 20 to 30 percent of injuries, no matter which database you're using. This is the study we did here, uh, which was we built a collaborative database where law enforcement unidirectionally shares their information with us. Right. We can't share. That's a fundamental problem. We can't share a lot of data back with them, if any. You can share aggregate data, but nothing beyond that. But they shared everything our way. What we found that is if you compile the trauma center and law enforcement database together, that the trauma center misses 17% of injuries. And guess who those are? Those are people that aren't hurt that bad, that don't come to a trauma center, and they're people that are dead on at the scene. You're missing two ends of the spectrum. Law enforcement, they're going to miss predominantly 20% of injuries. They're going to miss predominantly accidental injuries or intentional self-inflicted injuries. Kentucky's a non-report state, meaning there is no obligation to call if there's a gunshot wound in your healthcare facility. There's only five of them. There's only five non-report states. Kentucky's one of them. And this takes a tremendous amount of work to do, and you see the, 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 the folks that uh, help to uh, accumulate this data. This is a hard study to do. This is a hard study to do to come up with an incidence of injury. But we finally answered this question, okay, after, after years, <laughs> years of work from multiple people, we did it. We found the answer. It's 129.1. It's at least 129.1. Did we miss injuries? Absolutely. But we know it's at least 129.1. What if I use hospital data? It's 58. What if I use ER data? It's 48. What if I use law enforcement data? It's 110. 
those are huge differences, all right? And for someone that wants to have a conversation about this, this matters, okay? That's the incident to injury in Louisville, Kentucky. We finally got the answer, um, and, and, but it takes a significant amount of effort to do it. So what are the barriers here? Well, funding, uh, we talked about data gaps, disproportionate impact on populations we talked about, uh, special intergroup, interest groups. Obviously, there's money involved here. That always gets muddy. Fatalistic attitudes, I think, are important. Like a lot of people just say, there's just no solution to this. And as you think about data problems and as you think about research that's out there, I think it's worth knowing about the Dickey Amendment. 1996, this was a rider attached to the U.S. Uh, omnibus spending bill. A rider just uh, tacked on there. And it said, none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the CDC may be used to advocate or promote gun control. That is what it is, but it was interpreted as no research on firearm injury prevention can be done. That's the way it was interpreted by the CDC. So funding went to zero. So essentially, you know, stifling research in that way. Interestingly, in 2000, uh, later, Jay Dickey, the one name that the, that the Dickey Amendment's named for, came back and said, you know, we were wrong. Scientific research should be conducted into preventing firearm injury. Same evidence should be, you know, just like HIV, just like motor vehicle accidents, we should be using this data to determine how to improve it. This has been reinterpreted in 2018, and that's why there's that $8 million out there uh, to, to study this problem. Does a public health approach even work with trauma? All right, well, I'll tell you this, it does. What's a corollary? Motor vehicle accidents. You know, you go back there in the 1921 motor vehicle accidents, they just weren't that safe, right? And then they said, hey, you know what? If we put brakes on these things, less people are dying. And so they start putting brakes on these things. And then they start saying, you know what? If we got airbags, that works. So you can see the mortality per vehicular mile traveled has gone down and down and down. And this is what a public health approach looks like. If you look at our approach to firearm violence, it has gone up, up, up within the last few years. Those lines crossed with firearm injury resulting in more years, potential life loss than motor vehicle accidents in the United States. Does anything work? Does anything work out there? I mean, this is, uh, he's described this terrible situation and nothing works. Yes, there are evidence-based strategies that can address this. Three that are, have pretty good evidence. Cure violence, which is a community-based solution. Uh, group violence intervention, which is a law enforcement uh, community outreach-based public safety solution, and then hospital-based violent injury pre prevention programs. Those are the three that have data to reduce firearm injury. I think the origin story behind cure violence is good to know. It's really a completely different approach to violence. It says that violence is a, or it's, it's, it's an approaching it like violence is a communicable disease. And if you remember this, this uh, Dr. Schlecken, uh, he was an ID doctor, okay? And he worked his whole career in Africa with tuberculosis, cholera, and eventually the AIDS epidemic. He got burned out. He came home to Chicago. He's looking. He's like, what do I do now? Uh, and, you know, Chicago, there's just not, you know, we don't, we don't, have, we don't have the same infectious problems that we had in, uh, where he worked prior. But he starts looking at the map of homicides in Chicago, and he compares it to the map of cholera in Bangladesh, and he's, there's something here. There's some connection here. So this is the idea that violence can be treated as a communicable disease. So you take the principles from the World Health Organization as far as interrupting transmission, preventing future spread, changing group norms, and that's applied at the community level. This involves community violence interrupters, and it involves a whole host of things that are implemented in your city to address this problem. Do we have one in Louisville, Kentucky? We do, Pivot to Peace. You can see it's a collaboration, at least on the hospital side between U of L and Peace Education and multiple other community partners. How does it work? It works like this. Uh, if you're injured, there's a needs assessment performed and you're connected to multiple uh, community members and community needs, uh, or then those, those needs are met by multiple community partners that facilitate connection with what you need. So post-discharge follow-up, whether it's education, job placement. And so this is about a community coming together after someone's injured and trying to prevent re-injury. We used to say recidivism, now that term has gone out of favor uh, because it's connected to the criminal justice system, so now we say re-injury. So that's a hospital-based violent injury prevention program. We have one here. 
in order for you to evaluate whether that works or not, guess what? You got to have good data. So it goes all the way back to the beginning of the public health discussion where you have to define the problem. So from the collaborative database, we're able to determine that if you're shot within one year, there's a 4% chance you're going to be shot again. If you run it out to 10 years, it's 16%. That's all covered. If you want to look at specific subgroups, 35%, we get to 35% at 10 years in certain subgroups, all right? So uh, this helps you to say, what are the chances this person is going to be re-injured? And we implement a program, we measure the re-injury rate, and we can compare, the, or you can determine the overall efficacy of the program. Without that data, you can't even know if your program is doing anything, right? So you have to have a bit data to be able to do this. This is pivot to piece. This is the injury intervention prevention continuum. So you want to be maybe up here, individual and tertiary prevention. That's sort of a hospital-based side, right? We try to do, we, we expand it out to the community, but really you're saying you were injured. We don't want it to happen again. That's an individual tertiary level prevention, okay? So a lot of critics of that will say, well, that's way too downstream. You need to move upstream. You need to move upstream. And I mean, that's true, but you know, uh, it's worth every bit of time and effort that's spent by the people involved here in this program to do this tertiary individual level uh, prevention. But it is downstream. We admit that. And we do want to move up into the right. And we acknowledge that because as you look at this model and as you understand that within this model, you're talking about how individuals and play out within community and societal structures and that does have impact there. So what is the true impact of 129 injuries per 100,000 individuals? Well, as you all know, from going out in waiting rooms, talking to people, talking to families, getting to know families as patients that are lucky enough to recover from their injuries, you've spent time with them, children, they experience, the entire family experiences this together. The entire community oftentimes experiences this together. If you think about the kids in that relationship, these are what we call adverse childhood experiences, right? Do you remember being in the hospital as a kid vividly with whatever family member that was going through their illness at that time? We all remember these things vividly. So each of these are adverse childhood experiences. As injuries accumulate and adverse childhood experiences accumulate, it perpetuates a cycle, all right? Just as an example, this, uh, I'm gonna move this because this is important. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Future Healers Program. Okay, we've got people in here that work with the Future Healers Program. Um, and so these are kids four to 13 years old. What we did was we gave a survey and we also determined where firearm injuries were happening. We have the acoustic gunshot detection system that tells us how many shots were fired. This one child's home was within 400 meters of 51 firearm injuries over a three year period. 20,000 shots fired. That's 55 a day. 2.3 gunshots an hour. This kid is expected to get ready for their test, go out and play with their friends, and this is what they're experiencing. And uh, no kids should do this. Two-thirds of them had a family member injured by firearm. A third of them have had a peer another four to 13 year old injured by firearm. This is in Louisville, Kentucky. These are adverse childhood experiences. They impact everything that happens after that. All right, whether you wanna talk about diabetes, whether you wanna talk about obesity, heart disease, whether you wanna talk about your risk for intentional self-inflicted injury, impacts everything, all right? Every outcome is worse. It's the bottom of the pyramid, right? And so everything gets worse as you move through these periods of time. There's no hope. There is hope. And that's what our responsibility is as a trauma center, as human beings, is you can't provide all of these protective factors for adverse childhood experiences. Some of them have been in the family level. But guess what? There's this whole list of community protective factors and other human protective factors that can be implemented. Okay, And that's the idea behind the Future Healers, Future Healers program. Uh, so safe, engaging programs, strong partnerships with your community, identify with your community, healthcare, government sectors, feel like those services are there to provide help for you. 
So the idea behind the Futures Helix program is that we can help head off some of these adverse childhood experience at a layer of support. It's not a solution, but it's a layer of support. It's moving up and to the right on the injury or the prevention intervention continuum. It's moving up and to the right trying to facilitate that. Well, he's talked a lot about, but what, what is it? What the hell is it? Well, the mission of the program is to build stronger bridges between our healthcare community and the kids impacted by gun violence most. What's the model look like? Well, here it is. Medical students are the are the key cog in this. You can see that's a partnership between the Department of Surgery, the School of Medicine, our community partner, Christopher 2X Game Changers, which has been integral in this part, and then the hospital, U of L Health as a whole. As I said, you know, the medical students are put tremendous amount of effort, energy, and passion into this program. And we, you know, we acknowledge that and they do a fantastic job. Uh, Here's what it looks like. Again, four to 13 year olds, they come once a month. We've had lots of community partners jump in on the other side. This is what gives you hope is everyone starts to come out and say, how can we help? Golf house, donate a ballroom once a month. Okay, so we spend, we spend sessions there. YMCA, no problem. The, whatever you need, says the YMCA. This hospital, whatever you need. We have sessions in this room. Uh, the zoo got excited about it. They uh, built their offshoot, which is Future Healers Got Zoo Buddies. So the kids get to go hang out at the zoo and have this experience that just is fantastic. Um, here's what the curriculum looks like. There's all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, you talk about healthy teeth and dentistry, fire safety, sleep. It's not, we're not talking about guns for an hour once a month. We're trying to reduce firearm injury by promoting health, general health and well-being. That's the model. These are the results. This is all makes it worth it. And then you got to share what you're doing. You got to get out there. I don't see Jones here, but uh, Jones is a, the, a key, the key piece of this from a faculty perspective. I'm a cheerleader. So you, you got to share this. You got to go out and talk to politicians. You got to go out and do con congressional testimony and all this stuff to make sure that the other side of this whole debate uh, is heard. You got to build a multi-targeted community approach. I'm sorry, I have bad news for you. There is no one solution to this problem. There is no vaccine, all right? But there are solutions to this problem. And I hope you leave today with that more than anything else. Things do work. They require commitment, they require effort, and they require uh, a passion to be able to deal with this stuff. So we're finally, we got five minutes. So I'm gonna go through the surgical management of uh, firearm injury real quick in five minutes. This is the steel part. This is our primary responsibility of the people in this room as surgeons. I'm not gonna get into all that. I suppose that's why you're here. I suppose that's why those that are joining us by virtual means are uh, uh, wanting to learn how to care for individuals such as this. This last slide uh, is from the Scudder Oration by Dr. Schwab at Penn. And he said, you know what, how are we going to train the military surgeons of the future? Well, unfortunately, they can train right here in the United States. And these are the 19 trauma centers that met his criteria uh, for enough blunt, high acuity blood trauma, enough penetrating injuries that we can adequately prepare uh, military surgeons for war and conflict. This is a map you don't really want to be on. All right. But we are. And it's our responsibility to do this. So in conclusion, gun violence is multiple distinct public health issues. Uh, the socioecological model, if you haven't seen it, I think it's useful. I think it's something to, 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 that can help you understand the complexity of the problem. Um, Evidence-based collaborative initiatives work, but require real investment and sustained commitment. And we go back to those first slides, guns, germs, and steel. Jared Diamond's right. Probably the critics are right a little bit too. You know, that if you want to address uh, let's move this one last time. If you want to address this problem and look specifically at the firearm component and not look at the human component, your results ain't going to be that good. Flip side, if you want to just look at the, at the human component and ignore the firearm component, your results probably aren't going to be that good. So you have to address both of these in conjunction. This is Dr. J. David Richardson, our mentor here. This is him with many of the future healers. And uh, if uh, I've got I've got one minute, so I just want to share. I'm going to share one more thing with you. If I can.
This is from our future healers program. And this is what hope looks like to me. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> we got interviews to do. No question. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for uh, truly inspiring Graham Rounds. And um, uh, we would probably should take the next couple of minutes to, uh, for our virtual guests who are applying for residency programs to discuss how all of this might impact their training. Um, it, 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 from the picture you painted, it seems like Louisville is a dangerous place to live. And uh, we have a lot of penetrating and blunt trauma to deal with. Give us your perspective on uh, what you presented and what it means to be a surgery resident here. Yeah, so, you know, I was showing ben, Dr. Benz these slides before, and I had 30 more slides that talked about the surgical management. And he said, uh, so I blame him for not having a lot of the surgery. No, but uh, I, you know, that's the part that you come here for. That's the training that's essential. If you want to be well trained to do this, I showed you the slide where, unfortunately, these are locations where you can get training in this particular issue. And uh, I'm looking at our residents and I can see the number of hours and effort and passion that they put into this problem over the years. How many of you have operated on a gunshot wound? Yeah. So I just showed you that we had a thousand gunshot wounds in 2021. That's two to three a night, right? Do all those go to the operating room? Absolutely not. Abdominal gunshot wounds, you're going to operate on 90% of them. Chest gunshot wounds, you're going to operate on 40% of them. By the time you finish here, unfortunately, or you know, it's a mixed thing, you'll, you'll be well-versed in stopping bleeding and dealing with these injuries. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's anywhere better in the country to, to train to do that. Questions from the audience? Uh, can you hear me in there? This is Michael Flynn. Hey, Dr. Flynn, how are you? Yeah, we hear you. I'm good, Keith. How are you? Listen, good. that was that was an excellent grand rounds. The only comment that I would like to make is this problem is not going away until there is some reasonable, sensible gun uh, regulation. All of, you know what all these issues are, and until that is dealt with by the ideologic Neanderthals in the state legislature, you're going to be dealing with this problem for a long time. That was a great grand rounds. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Flynn, you're cutting out there. Right? <laughs> uh, I said this problem is not going away until there is some sensible gun uh, control regulation passed by uh, the state legislature. No, uh, point taken. Yeah. Absolutely. Everywhere in the country. And so I think it gets confusing when you start talking about trauma informed care as a trauma surgeon, because everybody thinks it relates to, you know, the trauma that we deal with every day, not the trauma, you know, so trauma informed care starts from a place where you acknowledge that the patient coming in has different experiences, has been through different things, and you leave everything that you bring with you at the door. And it's a hard thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. And anyone that suggests otherwise, you know, probably hasn't done it. Uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely it impacts things. You know, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, when I showed you that 
the black population has an eight times higher homicide rate. You know, some of that is we've gotten pretty good at taking care of salvageable firearm injuries, meaning, you know, gunshot wounds to the head have a high mortality, but truncal injuries, if you get to a hospital quickly, you have got a pretty good chance of surviving. But guess what is required for you to get to a hospital quickly? You got to be close to a hospital. You got to have EMS that, 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 that serves your region and your area. They've got to pick you up and they got to get you there. So you're talking about the bias. Yes, it's present in the hospital and it's present every point up to the hospital. And, you know. All right, we're going to have to stop there. Thank Dr. Miller for outstanding grand rounds. And uh, we will get on with our uh, presentations and interviews for our uh, resident applicants here uh, shortly. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's hit stop. Professional audio. Tell you what. Here, let me go. Oh.